he has a wonderful family. He is a wonderful man. He's very caring. He has done, um, he goes beyond um, sitting behind a desk and, and talking to patients in, in a professional setting. And I think I'm going to keep it at that today. If you have questions, he is more than welcome to answer your personal questions, and we'll probably have a good question and answer session. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Dear Father in heaven, you have been so kind and to given, have given us such a great handbook to take care of our body. You've given everything that we need from, from the very first day of creation to today. There is nothing that we should lack if we leave ourselves in your hands. I pray that your Holy Spirit will be with us today as we listen to Dr. Chung and the things that he has researched and prayed about. And I pray that um, we will be able to use these things and share with other people. We long for you to come back, and we want to be uh, strong and healthy when you do. So be with us today, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. I saw the rain, and I was driving about 50 minutes. It was exciting to drive through. You always want to, one of my tires on the front, front right is uh, going flat, so I need to, thankfully it's going flat slowly, so I think I have some time. <laughs> so today we're talking about health of body, and the reason we started with health of mind is because a lot of the changes that might be needed to get health of body would be challenging. And we have to encourage health, a healthy mind so that we would have the motivation to make the changes that we need to have a healthy body. And so that's the reason we went health of body, health of, health of mind, health of spirit, health of body last. And so I think you'll find this very interesting. Uh, we're going to talk about some of the big diseases we know today, what are the studies that have, and what actually causes them, and then how can you fix those things. And we're going to talk about some natural remedies. Uh, when people hear natural remedies, they automatically think herbs, but there are other, other possible natural remedies and how to use them effectively, and let's get right into it. So as a, as a physician, I, I hear this statement stated a lot. Let's see if I can get that. Trust the science. How many of you guys heard that? And I, uh, I'm not a big fan of this statement because what exactly would you call science? I mean, scientists, they always find one thing, and then later they prove something else was actually true, and it's constantly changing, and to say something vague like trust the science is kind of like saying, uh, I remember Brother Daniel up there, he said, trust the hypothesis. You're basically trusting someone's hypothesis about the situation. And so we find that this mistake is made a lot in general in the medical science, and one example of that that I just wanted to highlight as we go through some research, uh, research is constantly changing, is the Vioxx scandal. Have you guys heard of that? The situation that happened with the medication Vioxx? Yeah, Vioxx, it was a, it's a very sad situation. So in November 1998, Merck requested, Merck is a pharmaceutical company, they requested approval from the FDA for Vioxx. And what happened is in 1999, they launched, they launched a huge study to kind of test the efficacy of Vioxx. It is a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug, and it, it, you know, it's supposed to have less GI issues and things of that nature. So they were kind of like, okay, this is great, this is the next best thing. Well, the F, you know, the, the study came out, the FDA saw it, and they approved Vioxx. Well, there were some major issues. The Vigor study was submitted to the New England Journal of Medicine but what was left out were several heart attacks that were caused during the study period. And so that was, that's a big deal, right? Well, it was left out when it was submitted. Unfortunately, it took years before other physicians who were concerned did a randomized control trial, the approved study, and that showed Vioxx raised the risk of heart attacks and Merck ended up withdrawing Vioxx from the market because of this. Well, obviously, people, when they got a public ear of this, they were not very happy about that because maybe a family member or maybe themselves were on that medication, and there were some major lawsuits against Merck after that news came out. 
And so what was the net result? I mean, you know, this is something that replays a lot, unfortunately, in the medical world. A medication comes out, you prove, okay, it's safe, and then it's not safe, and then lawsuits. Well, this was the net result. The Merck made $11 billion. That was the net gain. And the lawsuits, the losses they got from lawsuits was $4.85 billion. So if you look at the net situation, they really gained $6.15 billion considering the losses from the lawsuit. So does that discourage the behavior or does it continue that type of behavior? In our, unfortunately, it continues because the companies continue, no one's cr criminally prosecuted, it just continues on and on because it's an entity, a company, right? So the net result, unfortunately, in terms of life, was 88,000 heart attacks were estimated to have been caused by Vioxx during that five-year period, and unfortunately, 38,000 actually caused death. So this was a very, this is a very big deal, right? This, this issue of science, and this is published in a reputable journal, the New England Journal of Medicine, but yet later on finding out that what was submitted was actually not accurate. It's not to blame the journal or to blame, you know, at the end of the day, this was deception, right? It was a deception. So what were the tactics used in the Vioxx scandal? They emphasized the efficacy and the safety of it. They falsified and hid concerning safety data. And unfortunately, there were cardiologists speaking out, and some of them lost their university positions and various things, and they were cardiologists, obviously. So they targeted physicians who spoke out against the drug. And it's, it's, it's a sad reality of the world we live in. It, re it really reminds me of this verse, right? First Timothy 6.10, for the love of money is the root of all evil. Talking about money can be found as the root of all sorts of evil that happens in this world. People pursuing money over caring about other individuals. So as a physician, I have to ask myself, are scientific journals really trustworthy? Because if I'm reading this and I'm not sure where the background data is, are they really trustworthy? I think you have to read any science with a grain of salt. You have to really consider that there might be some conflicts of interest. And I, I was shocked to hear some statements from individuals who are physicians who were in positions of editing lead journals and what they just said when they finally left that editing position. Marcia Angel, she said, it is, she was an editor for the New England Journal of Medicine for about two decades and she was the chief editor for, I believe, about nine years or so. She said it's simply no longer possible to believe much of the clinical research that is published or to rely on the judgment of trusted physicians or authoritative medical guidelines, which are based off of those studies. I take no pleasure in this conclusion, which I reached slowly and reluctantly over my two decades as editor of the New England Journal of Medicine. So she comes out of this and she draws this conclusion, which is pretty shocking, right? Because I'm a physician, there's guidelines, and I, you know, many of the guidelines I find valuable, but at the same time, you're in this world where there is a lot of lying that happens, right? Uh, Richard Horton kind of said the same thing. He was over The Lancet, that's also a world renowned medical journal. He was a chief editor as well. He said the case against science is straightforward. Much of the scientific literature, perhaps half, he was kind of estimating, may simply be untrue. Afflicted by studies with small sample sizes, tiny effects, invalid exploratory analyses, and flagrant conflicts of interest. What conflicts of interest means is the ones who were conducting the study that's proving something were actually the ones who were gonna make money if it actually proved something. So that's a conflict of interest. And unfortunately, being a chief editor, he's seeing a lot of this, and he's realizing there is just too much of this in these journals for me to personally trust it, right? And so he said, science is taking a turn towards darkness. Kind of reminded me of the Dark Ages, actually, because Galileo was arguing that the Earth is actually revolving around the sun. The position of his time was that the, everything revolves around the Earth, and the church at that time was running the state. And so him having such a strong position based off of his findings that the Earth actually revolves around the sun got him in some serious trouble. He's on house arrest for the rest of his life. I think it was tw the last 20 years of his life were just on house arrest for disagreeing in the realm of science, and that was the Dark Ages. And, and disagreeing sometimes with medical science can get you in trouble, to be honest. I, you know, sometimes I'm not always in agreement with my peers on certain things, and 
you know, it can, those things can get very heated. I obviously don't like arguing, so I don't get into too many, too many arguments. I try to stay away from that. But um, this is one thing that I found is there's a, a heavier reliance on drugs. And I'm not saying, okay, just stop all your medications, go home, stop it all. You might, you need to go talk with your physician about how can we truly get rid of these diseases a different way before doing some of those things because you can have some harmful effects just suddenly discontinuing things. But cholesterol lowering drugs, you know, for many with high cholesterol, they're started on this. And I think that's the standard medical approach. You have high cholesterol, well, it's never, the next question is never, I wonder what's causing your high cholesterol. The next question is, what should we use for your high cholesterol? And is that really logical? It's not logical, because if we know the cause, then we can address the cause, and then we can actually get rid of the high cholesterol, right? Instead, it's a selection of medications. When you select the medication, it's usually statin drugs. Uh, here's the truth about statin drugs, and this is, we're finding out more and more about drugs over time, because people report this, and then someone studies it, and you find out a new effect, right? Well, we found out that a statin drug, there's a 1% chance that's gonna elevate a lot of your liver enzymes indicating liver injury. So that's one in every 100 persons is gonna experience that. The second thing is, and unfortunately, it's very hard as a physician to memorize all these side effects and know it for every single drug that you use. I'll just be honest, I'm, I have to sometimes look it up to see if this medication is creating this. Memory loss and confusion. I'll tell you a story about this. There was a patient, they were suffering memory loss, it was drastic over a year. And it was kind of like their family members were very concerned. And you know when you're, when you're elderly, people just assume, oh man, you're just getting demented, right? You're getting dementia, that's what's happening. And well, this family wasn't like that. They said, no, something's going on. And they looked it all up and they realized, wow, I think statins actually cause memory loss. So they stopped the, the statins and guess what, within a few months, the memory started to come back and recover. And so this is a very real thing. Now the problem is, if you're on a statin medication and it happens to you, one, if you're the one with memory loss, it's gonna be hard for you to try to figure it out because you're dealing with you know, mental confusion. Whereas, if you have a loving family member, they can help you figure it out. Or if you have a physician who's aware of this, they can say, okay, this must be related to this medication that we started a year ago. You see how it can be very challenging for a two and two to get put together? Well, that is frequently the case. And this is just one example. The other thing you find about statin medications is they are linked to new onset diabetes. So you're trying to lower the cholesterol, all of a sudden diabetes is onset. And diabetes is gonna increase your risk of heart attacks and other things like that. So you see that there's a pattern. Now you're on a new medication for diabetes and you're on your cholesterol medication. So, is this incidence very high? Like new onset, I know, prog progression of my current diabetes or new onset diabetes. Well, it's a seven to 25% risk of developing diabetes newly if you're on a statin medication. That seven to 25 just depends on which statin medication is being used because some are more implicated than others. That is shocking, right? Seven to 25%, that's a really high incidence of diabetes for an individual just because of a medication. And to me, I consider it unacceptable. Well, some surveys were done because we wanted to find out how much nutrition education, so they surveyed physicians to find out how much nutrition education were you getting in medical school. And 22% of the polled physicians received no nutrition education in medical school. 35% reported having nutrition education in a single lecture. I'll raise my hand for that one. I was a 35%. I received one lecture. Only 21%. What was it from the perspective of the patients? Only 21% of patients feel they receive effective communication in the area of nutrition from their physicians. And so is there a deficiency in the, at the education level? Absolutely. Nutrition is an essential part of what we do every day and it impacts our health. If physicians are not getting trained in nutrition, I know Loma Linda has been making some changes to start incorporating that more because they realize the importance. But this is a big deal because this is around the country over 50% of physicians are getting at most one lecture. That's, you know, maybe the other 50% were getting two lectures and that's why they weren't selecting that, right? Well, the issue it creates is for decades, physicians have emphasized the importance of practicing evidence-based medicine. We had an evidence-based medicine class in my medical school and I do think it's important to look at the evidence because sometimes the evidence does help you pick a good option. 
Yet, when it comes to incorporating the vast amount of evidence supporting positive health outcomes from lifestyle practices and habits, the medical community has been relatively slow to respond. I'll tell you the trend of medicine right now. It's very sad, and many of my colleagues agree with this. Um, the trend of medicine is to increase patient volume because reimbursement is tending to drop. And so you'll find that your visits start to go down and down in, in the time that you're in there, right? You come in, boom, boom, and then you're out. And you're like, what just happened? I, th I waited about you know, one hour, and I was in there for about five minutes. <laughs> and so that's the trend. And how much nutrition counseling do you think you're going to get in about five minutes of a visit? Because then now there's the computer documentation for the physician. I'm not trying to get on your physician. Um, there's a computer documentation aspect, and then there's all these other paperwork, and you got to put orders and billing. It's just almost like not, it's not feasible to produce a healthy community with this model, right? So numerous studies have shown that physicians' own physical activity behavior predicts the likelihood that they will recommend physical activity to their patients. We now know physical activity is amazing for many things. Unfortunately, it's been estimated that less than 40% of physicians regularly counsel their patients on the importance of increasing physical activity. That simple change, which can actually produce a lot of good for an individual, is not encouraged a lot. And they say that if someone is not physically active themselves, they're less likely to counsel their patients on physical activity. And, and I know that to be true. And I know it to be true within the realm of medicine. I talked to a lot of my diabetic patients, and I was like, you didn't realize that your diabetes is reversible? And I'm in shock because to me, this has been out for, for probably a century at this point. And I'm, you know, but unfortunately it's not being relayed. And if your physician is not putting into practice healthy lifestyle changes, they're less likely to tell you to put into practice healthy lifestyle changes. And the rationale is, ah, oh, that might be too hard for them. Well, let, let the patient decide if that something is too hard for them or not, you know? So what I consider to be the true medical approach, and this is a book that I received when I graduated from my medical school, and I absolutely love it, it's called Ministry of Healing, is disease is an effort of nature to free the system from conditions that result from a violation of the laws of health. So there are laws that govern our body, and we don't follow those laws, all of a sudden we're having sickness enter our health. In case of sickness, the cause should be ascertained. You gotta figure out the cause, number one. Unhealthful conditions should be changed, wrong habits corrected, then nature is to be assisted in her effort to expel impurities and to reestablish right conditions in the system. So let me put that a different way. A true medical approach seeks to find the root causes of the disease a patient is suffering from and addressing those causes. Does that make sense? Is that pretty logical? You have a disease, let's figure out what's causing it, let's address those causes. Simple, right? To me, a false medical approach is this. You can continue to do what is causing your disease and not have the ill effects of your disease. Don't worry about that. We'll take care of that. As long as you take this drug, and you know what? I'm, I'm not trying to bash drugs. You can put as long as you take this herb too. You're continuing the bad habit and you're gonna use this to try to treat your, your you get what I'm saying? You're gonna take this, or, or as long as you do this diet for so, such and such a time, you lose enough weight. And you get what I'm saying? We can't approach disease like that. We need to figure out causes and then go from cause to actually treatment. Truth, free from financial incentives, is, the, is important in the medical world. This is very important because the more we have the financial incentive, this industry is influencing the studies, that influence, then patients suffer because they're not getting truth because their physician is getting fed something totally different. So that was, that was just our intro to what's going on, right? But let's get to stuff that's actually going to help people. The Adventist health message, if you realize that the Adventist church has a lot of different hospitals, they're very focused on health, they're hospitals overseas, hospitals locally, there's always like uh, physicians that are passionate about health. There's a reason for that because the church itself is passionate about the necessity of, of health, right? And so many in the church have what's called the, the Adventist health message. I remember I was at the Lifestyle Medicine Conference in Costa Rica and just talking with some of the leadership, and one of them was an Adventist. She's like, this is so weird. You're a young physician. What are you doing? Like, what attracted you here? 
And I said, honestly, a lot of these things I learned being a Seventh-day Adventist. I just, you know, this is, we talk health all the time. Since I was in high school, I've been talking about health and making changes so that I can take care of my body because I believe God wants me to take care of this body that he's given me. And so they're intrigued by this, this passion for health. So I'm going to give you a, a nuggetized version of the Adventist health message. We're not going to go into every single detail about it. But principle that is, a principle that's very important is perfect health depends upon perfect circulation. There's this value in the blood and taking care of the blood, making sure you get toxins out and keeping healthy components to build good blood. That is like a core premise of it. And the reason where that comes from is Leviticus 17, 14. It says, you shall eat the, uh, the blood of no manner of flesh, for the life of all flesh is in the blood. So the Bible explicitly states that there is life-giving force contained within the blood. So what are the secrets to health? If that is the premise, having good circulation, having good blood, excellent blood quality. How can I build good blood and keep good blood? And how can I get the blood to circulate everywhere it's supposed to? Because obviously if it's not circulating, I remember when I was in, um, in medical school on surgery rotation, someone had leg surgery uh, to kind of help with the arteries were, were blocked. So they had to kind of create a bypass. And later that night, they had a blood clot and the, the foot went totally white. Like, and there's no, there's no warmth or anything. Can that foot survive very long without that circulation? So circulation of the blood is just as important as the quality of the blood. And we'll talk about why that's important and how so, there are some things that we do every day that affects our circulation in a negative way. So this is uh, kind of the summary statement of the Adventist health message. Pure air, sunlight, abstemiousness, rest, exercise, proper diet, the use of water, trust in divine power, these are the true remedies. Every person should have a knowledge of nature's remedial agencies and how to apply them. So we, we kind of colloquially refer this to as, as the eight laws of health, right? So we'll, and we'll talk about what those things actually mean. So true health, and we talked about trust in God and um, mental health on Friday and Saturday. So we're not going to go deeper into that. But I kind of had my own acronym acronym that kind of stresses specific areas, trust in God, rest, unselfish love, and that, that's an important part of the mental health, exercise, hydration and hydrotherapy, eat right, air, light, temperance, and finally a healthy state of mind. So this is a list of Diseases that I have actually read the study and they reverse the disease with very specific changes. And it's interesting because the changes are very similar for all conditions. So severe heart disease, type 2 diabetes, hypertension, obesity, high cholesterol, hyperlipidemia, and an early, interesting early stage prostate cancer. They have actually generated studies showing reversal of early stage prostate cancer. And these are all just with lifestyle changes. I'm not talking about other interventions. So let's look at heart disease a little bit, because this is our number one killer in the United States. And this, it's important to know how to take care of your heart, especially being the number one killer. There was a trial done by Dean Ornish. He's actually out in San Francisco, so not too far from here. And he, it was a the lifestyle heart trial, and says intensive lifestyle changes for reversal of coronary heart disease. His goal was not to put a pause on it. His goal was to try to get it going the other way. So heart disease, there's blockage in the arteries that supply blood to the heart. If there's no circulation, obviously the heart is not doing well. So what did they do? They had 48 patients with moderate to severe coronary heart disease, and they were randomized, meaning they were put into two categories randomly. Intensive lifestyle change group or the usual care group. The usual care group, they said, you know what, you continue to follow with your physician and follow what their recommendations are. And in the intensive, they had very specific recommendations. Well, look at the difference between these two groups. The diameter of stenosis, so how much were the arteries blocked? How much was the blood flow blocked in these arteries? After one year in the experimental or the intervention group, 4.5% improvement. They were actually improving in blood flow to their heart. 
After five years, 7.9% further improvement. The control group, the group that, you know, just do exactly what, what your cardiologist tells you, after one year, 5.4% worsening. They were, this is the typical track of heart disease in most cases. It just continues to get worse. After five years, 27.7% worsening. So not, not a good route, right? We're now looking at possibly surgeries and different interventions to try to, try to stop this. The control group, if you look at just events being heart attacks, surgery, hospitalizations, or death, the control group had 45 events and they were only 20 patients. So each patient probably averaging about two events, two major events within that period. Whereas the experimental group had 25 events for 28 patients, meaning there were some patients that actually didn't have an event during that whole period. So a drastic difference between those two. Episodes of angina, do you guys know what angina is? Basically, it's um, chest pain because the heart's not getting sufficient blood flow for the acti activity level it's trying, the demand that it's having, right? So ch it manifests as chest pain. And obviously you can see that that could be limiting, like you're running and then all of a sudden you get chest pain because your heart can't handle all that extra running and needing to pump that much blood. Well, the control group had a 165% increase in the number of episodes of chest pain related to exertion usually. The experimental group was a 95% reduction in episodes. They were getting less episodes. What impact do you think that was having on their life? A positive one or a negative one? Positive, you're able to do more, you don't have to worry about your chest hurting you every time you do something. And then finally, cholesterol levels were reduced by 6%, so there was some reduction for the control group, whereas the experimental group, they reduced 37.2%. That's actually better than most cholesterol medications. So the question is, what did they encourage this experimental group to do? This was not a live-in program where you're sitting there living for five years with a physician overseeing you. This was just a recommendation and a really encouraging them to do that. They did five things. They said a 10% fat vegetarian diet, meaning not our typical vegetarian diet of today. I can tell you that most vegetarian diets today are not less than 10% fat. If you eat veggie meat, it has way more than 10% fat. That's a guarantee. So if it's a veggie meat heavy or that type of vegetarian diet or fake cheeses, a lot of those are very high in fat. Or if you're frying things, it's going to be high fat. You're going you're to break that 10% pretty easy. Even nuts. This is something that I see a lot. People eating a lot of nuts. A handful is probably sufficient for a day. You don't want to go over a handful. I had a patient with macular degeneration. I tell my macular degeneration patients, do not eat over 10% fats because there is a connection between the gut bacteria and the ones that get fed by fat for some reason release toxins for macular degeneration. And uh, they've shown that in studies. So I tell them, do less than 10%. And one of them was, he, he went totally plant-based and he was actually eating a lot of nuts. And so he's getting worse. And I'm like, he's plant-based and he's getting worse. This doesn't make any sense. So I had to go through his diet, find out he's eating a lot of nuts and say, hey, you got to put the pause button on the nuts. And the other thing about a lot of nuts is a lot of them can have added oil because they roast it. So you got to be careful with those two things with nuts. Nuts are extremely healthy in the right form. You don't want the roasted because it has the added oils and that's just not healthy at all. Moderate aerobic exercise. So when I say moderate, they literally just told them we want you to walk every day. That's pretty simple, right? For, for some people, that's difficult. Stress management training, smoking cessation, and group psychosocial support. So this is a very simple program in that respect, but the most difficult part is probably the dietary aspect, right? Well, I actually tried this. Um, I had a, a, a church member, we were going to prayer meeting, and he kept telling us, this is during the pandemic, that his insurance coverage lapped, lapsed and he, they wouldn't give him any insulin. So now he has no insulin. His blood sugar is just out of control. And he's, kind of, he's asking for prayer every prayer meeting. And I just look at my wife and we're just like, honestly, like we're praying about this. Can we do anything about this? Right? So <laughs> we decide to bring him into our home, him and his wife. And, and he has diabetes, heart disease, um, high blood pressure, several things. 
So I'm like, this is basically like an inpatient management of someone. And we just say, hey, you're going to eat what we eat. We eat a whole food plant-based diet at that time. And we had him, when he couldn't walk more than 10 feet. So literally, he walks here, walks about, you know, maybe 10 steps, and that's it. So I'm like, I don't know how you're going to do aerobic exercise. You can only walk. So I said, you know what? What they usually do is a graded exercise program. Just do what you can. <laughs> and so if you're going to walk 10, 10 feet, walk 10 feet for the day, and we're good. So stress management, obviously, we, we were doing some um, uh, different counseling in that respect and just supporting him. This is live group psychosocial support. And what happened is during that 10-day period, we can actually track his blood sugars. We can track everything. We had to stop. We didn't even need insulin anymore. His blood sugar went normal within the 10 days, and which is shocking. He was on high levels of insulin. I think it was about 60. So 60 units, that's, that's a very high dose. The other thing is he went from walking 10 feet to walking, I think he walked about a full block, a full block or maybe even more. So he was actually walking around. It's not that he was exhausted. He just, you know, was probably not used to that level of activity for a while. So that, that uh, physical element was getting to him. So these things really work, and they work fast. You figure 10 days to get back to from 10 feet to walking a full block, those, those little things make a big difference. But not only that, we found that they actually start to reverse the process that's causing the disease. The blood pressure started going normal. We had to, I, you know, when you're working with somebody in, in that realm and, and such a drastic change, you have to be careful because if you're on a blood sugar medication, the blood sugar can start dropping rapidly. And then you have hypoglycemia, which is dangerous for the heart. So you, it's kind of like this teeter-totter. And if you decide you're going to be helping people like that, you want to make sure that they have their physician on speed dial and their office actually picks up or an office nurse picks up because they're going to have to help you manage stopping some of these things and, and making these changes. So is fat really that big of a deal in my diet? Well, look at the effect of one single high-fat meal on endothelial function. What endothelial cells are, they are the cells that line your blood vessels. They regulate. Is it going to dilate? Is it going to constrict? Where are you going to go? Well, if you eat one single high-fat meal, this is what it does to endothelial cells. That top line is normal. The bottom line, right after the high-fat meal, one hour later, it's drastically dropping. The amount of blood flowing through the arteries is significantly dropping. Can you imagine that? Just within an hour, it's not like this takes years. This happens immediately. After four hours, it's at its lowest. That means your, your arteries are extremely constricted at this point. Then it starts to recover. After, it's not even normal after six hours. But guess what happened before the six-hour mark? Lunchtime, right? <laughs> you go and get the next meal. And if it's a high-fat meal, guess what? Those blood vessels are constantly like this until you go to sleep. And so this is, we can see what drastic impact it has. I always think of it like this. If God really wanted us to eat high fat, the first thing he gave us was a plant-based diet in Genesis 129, right? And so is it really easy to access fats eating a plant-based diet? I'm talking about actually from the plant. Well, the fats I could think of is like avocado, but that's seasonal. Maybe I'll eat fats during the avocado season. Um, nuts are very hard to access. Do you, have you guys just like picked it, like the fruit off the tree and then get it off and then try to like get a nutcracker to break it? You won't be eating a lot of nuts. <laughs> Let's just be honest. But we get them straight in the bag and we can eat them all day, right? So look at how God made it. And that's the intention. You weren't meant to eat a lot of that, but just eat in moderation, right? And the other thing about it is, um, as a funny story, we had a, there was a cashew plant. We were in Costa Rica at the time. Uh, for the Lifestyle Conference, and one of our friends, he, you know, he got a fruit, the cashew plant. Like, oh, this is so cool. This is a cashew plant. Uh, they eat, somebody eats the fruit, and then he has the seed. He's like, oh, I got to crack it open. I got to get this cashew. Well, he decides to use his teeth, and he's trying to crack it open with his teeth, and he's like, I'm starting to get this tingling sensation in my mouth, and I'm like, hold up. Is there anything toxic about, <laughs> about the cashew plant? Well, the seed has a, a really toxic component in it that can actually kill you. So we're, uh, we're like, we're on this bus driving, who knows where, we got an hour ride, 
I was like, is, this, is he going to die on this, you know, is he going to die on this bus? So we're, we're panicking. I'm like, you know, somebody whoops out Google to try to figure out what we're going to do. Thankfully, somebody in the group, and we're going to talk about this, has charcoal, activated charcoal. They get the charcoal out. He swishes it in his mouth. The sensation goes away after a few minutes, and we're just like, close call. All right? And then we're monitoring him after that, but he did just fine. So they're, they're even protected from us eating them, and that means we're not really supposed to eat them a lot. The second condition I want to talk about is type 2 diabetes, and we're comparing it to the, you know, the Adventist health message. We see it's mostly a lifestyle change message. Type 2 diabetes is interesting because there's a trend right now, and it's called the keto diet. Have you guys maybe know someone who's tried it, or maybe you tried it yourself. My mom was trying it, and I had to reason with her. But um, let's look at it. So the efficacy of low-carbohydrate ketogenic diets in type 2 diabetes. This is a study just comparing if it helps, right? Well, it's interesting that blood sugars do get better. Look at the top left. It drops substantially. It's almost going to normal. If you look at it from a perspective of body weight, the weight's going down, 56 weeks. The cholesterol, total cholesterol is going down. The HDL is going up. It just seems like this is amazing, right, from a numerical perspective. Do diseases have numerical causes? Is, is the number the cause, or is the number just a symptom of whatever else is going on? That's what you really have to think about, right? Because this is obviously helping from a numerical perspective. So what is the cause of type 2 diabetes? It makes you really think, right? What is really causing it? Is this really reversing their type 2 diabetes? I mean, well, obviously, if you eat zero sugar in your diet, zero carbohydrates, there is no glucose. Your blood sugar is going to be totally fine. And then if you're in a fasting state, you're going to lose weight because your body is kind of like in a starvation phase. That's why it goes into fasting, right? Well, is high blood sugar the cause of diabetes? Is carbohydrate intolerance or insulin resistance the cause of diabetes? Well, last I checked when I was in medical school, is insulin resistance, not necessarily the high blood sugar, right? The high blood sugar is just a result of the carbohydrate intolerance. So this is just a symptom. This is just a finding. The real cause is the carbohydrate intolerance. The body, for some reason, is not processing carbohydrates properly. So. What are some dietary factors that influence your ability to actually process carbohydrates? This was 1927 they found this out. The dietary factors that influence your carbohydrate tolerance. Fats are the red. So after eating fats, look at how the blood sugar acts. Spikes up, right? Whereas with carbohydrates, which is the green, it actually doesn't spike up. So it's not a carbohydrate problem that's creating the insulin, resist, the insulin sensitivity or insulin resistance issue. High carbohydrate diets and insulin efficiency, they actually studied to see if there's some difference between the high a high carb versus a high fat diet on your insulin sensitivity. Well, they put them on a high fat diet for a week and then tested, and look at that, a huge spike in the blood sugar just like we see in diabetes. Put another individual on a high-carb diet, and they found that it's pretty close to what it normally should be. Those were studies from like the 1920s, and the other one was from 1930s, so this is not new information. But we do have some new information. Acute dietary fat intake initiates alterations in the energy metabolism and insulin resistance. Remember I said diabetes is caused by insulin resistance. Ins the body just doesn't respond properly to insulin like it's supposed to. So when they put people on a high-fat diet, within four hours, actually, I believe this was a four hours, it decreased their whole body, hepatic and adipose tissue insulin sensitivity. Within hours, you're seeing the very cause of diabetes manifest itself with just one intake of a high saturated fat. I think they used palm oil or something like that. To, um, they just gave him palm oil, and within hours, you have insulin resistance, which we see in type 2 diabetes. Saturated fat ingest ingestion rapidly increases insulin resistance. That is the true cause of 
type 2 diabetes. Insulin sensitivity and glucose tolerance are altered by maintenance on a ketogenic diet. So since the ketogenic diet improves the blood sugar, does it improve the root cause, which is the insulin resistance? Is that a good question? Yeah, what, what impact does it have on insulin resistance? Well, maintenance on a ketogenic diet resulted in decreased sensitivity to peripheral insulin. They had insulin resistance the longer you do a ketogenic diet. And so you're not able to tolerate glucose or processed sugars properly the longer you do it, and impaired glucose tolerance. Now, what can reverse diabetes? You'll find that the answer tends to repeat itself. Effects of seven days on ad libitum. You know, when you're diabetic, you have to like monitor how much carbs you're eating and all these types of tracking. They said, you know what, you could just eat as much as you want, that's fine, as long as you limit to less than 10% fats. That's basically what they did. And what they found, so this is a, a low-fat plant-based diet, whole food diet containing less than 10% of calories from fat. 91% of the participants reduced or dis completely discontinued their oral diabetes medications. Remember, this was seven days of doing this, just changing the diet, and what a drastic impact that had. So did, do you feel like the insulin resistance was fixed? It fixes very rapidly. Your body has a way to heal itself if you give it the right conditions. So fasting blood glucose decreased, but remember, it decreased even though they were stopping their medications. Their blood pressure dropped eight points as well in seven days, dropping eight points. Another study looked at it, the acute effects of the DASH diet and a whole food plant-based diet, and they checked it with regards to insulin resistance, right? Insulin resistance being the primary cause. Does it really help with insulin resistance? We have to look at it uh, from both sides for both diets. Well, one week on a whole food plant-based diet decreased insulin resistance by 49%. Does this look like it's getting rid of the disease and getting rid of the high blood sugar? Absolutely. Insulin sensitivity was 38% higher. The body was better able to manage sugars, so the sugar doesn't spike like it used to. So that's diabetes, right? There's another thing about diabetes. Um, you know, it's, diabetes causes problems through end glyca advanced glycation end products. That's a long word. And it, so they looked at, does the ketogenic diet decrease or increase those chemicals in the body? Because that's really what's doing the damage to your blood vessels and all these things in diabetes. They found that being on the ketogenic diet, even though your blood sugars were normal, you had high, you had double the levels of advanced glycation end products. So very likely you're doing some major damage to the blood vessels with that. Does that make sense? So that's why I, I usually, I try to discourage my patients on a ketogenic diet. It's like, listen, this does not end well. And a lot of times we'll see the development of, of uh, severe vascular disease, such as heart disease or heart attacks. And, and um, a lot of times with the excess exposure to animal products or um, the high fats and some of the, you know, a lot of toxins store in fats. And so if you're eating a lot of fats, especially animal fats, uh, for example, if a, if a cow is eating grass that's been sprayed with like herbicide or something, you're, you're better off if you were to just eat the grass with the herbicide than eating the cow that ate the herbicide. Because what happens is that concentrates in the fat of the animal. And it made me wonder if that's exactly why God said don't eat the fat of the animal. But it concentrates in the fats. So when you eat the fats of the animal, guess what? You're getting a multiplied dose of whatever toxin that animal was exposed to. So that's why it just creates a really serious situation in the end. And a lot of times that can lead to cancer, depending on what the chemical is or whatever the, the um, effect that chemical is going to have on your body. I have to tell a lot of my patients about fish. I had a weight loss competition in my clinic one time. Let's see, who's going to win? I didn't want to win. I was like, I don't want to lose any weight. I'm pretty slim, and I don't want to get any slimmer because I'm going to start disappearing, and people are going to think I'm sick. And so we had a weight loss competition, and I ended up winning the competition in the clinic. And I was like, well, there must be some misunderstanding on how to lose weight. Well, one of our group actually gained weight. And I was like, hold on, what were you doing to try to lose weight? You know what she did? She actually replaced all the meat she eats 
with fish. Fish, for every serving of fish you eat per week, that increases your risk of diabetes by 5%. And I think about fish, they tend to be very high in fats, but more than just fats, I have to counsel my glaucoma patients, be careful with fish, please don't eat it, because you have very advanced glaucoma, and fish tends to have a lot of heavy metal contamination. And that's a big problem. I'm sure fish, like 100 or 200 years ago, was amazing and super healthy, lots of omega-3s. But today, unfortunately, we have to deal with this situation where if you dump in the ocean, it's going to get in the fish, and it's going to concentrate. That's called um, bioaccumulation, where toxins concentrate in the animals. Because they're going to eat the plants, and it's going to continue concentrating in the fats of the animals. So it's a very sad situation with regards to fish. Quick examples of saturated fat, there's very few plants that have saturated fat. So saturated fat I usually associate with animals. Um, pretty much any animal product is going to have saturated fat mostly. Uh, with regards to plants, coconuts, I believe, are, they have saturated fat. So I think that's one of the only ones that actually has saturated fat. Then there's the polyunsaturated fat and the unsaturated fat. And it gets a little complicated the deeper you go into, like, what are these different things? Is that pretty clear for heart disease? Have we figured out how to reverse that? What studies have shown and high blood pressure, they're very similar. Change your diet, get more active. Um, the diet is very specific. Eat more plants. The more plants you eat, the less toxins you're getting exposed to. You don't want to make it more than 10% fat in your diet. And for, I've seen even studies where they didn't say oh, completely eliminate animals, but they said less than 10% fat, and that ends up eliminating a lot of animal products by default. So high blood pressure, this is another big one that we deal with. There are a lot of causes, and it's not always change your diet. Sometimes it's change your mindset. If someone's in a state of chronic stress, that will raise your blood pressure, and, and you can do some of these other things and they'll help, but really the root cause might just be they need to, there might be some unforgiveness like we talked about yesterday, or some of these other things, angerness, bitterness, that's in the heart. But hypertension, this is kind of a summary. I got this from Nutrition Facts, which is uh, Dr. Gregor, Michael Gregor. And he did this really great chart that shows what different lifestyle changes do and how much it'll lower your blood pressure. And I was like, this is great. If you stop drinking alcohol and you actually drink alcohol, you'll drop it by five points. So there's this relationship, right? If you lose 10 pounds, weight loss, we're always told that weight loss is good for you and it helps with the blood pressure. Well, you drop it about seven points. If you eat more fruits and veggies, like just start eating more fruits and veggies, you'll drop it about seven points as well. I had one of my uh, technicians in the OR, he was diagnosed with high blood pressure, he didn't want to start on my medication. And he said, no, I don't want to start any medication. I want to know what I need to do. So he said he started eating more fruits. <laughs> And I was thinking, I was like, huh, I wonder what impact that's going to have. Let's see. <laughs> His blood pressure actually went normal, and that was the main change he made. He started eating a lot more fruits than he did. Obviously, if you eat more fruits, you're going to eat less animal products because now you have more plants in your diet, and you're going to get full. So I, I just found it was interesting, an interesting uh, finding. Regular aerobic exercise lowers your blood pressure more than eating more fruits and vegetables, and that lowered it by about 8 more fruits and vegetables plus eating less meat, that combination led to a lowering of 10. A typical antihypertensive drug will lower it about 15. But less sodium was better than all those other things. That lowered it about 15, even better than the antihypertensive drugs. A plant-based diet, a whole food plant-based diet, drops it by about, it looks like 18 or so. Now, if you incorporate plant-based diet plus intermittent fasting, and I'll show you what that is later, you can actually drop it over 35 points. And so that is a drastic drop. Let's say you are in the emergency level over 180, you can almost get it, you can definitely get it within a range where it's no longer an emergency, right? Now, we, what we are going to talk about some natural remedies. I figure we could start right now. What are some things that have been found to actually help with blood pressure issues, right? 
Remember, you always want to address the root cause, but it's okay to help your body kind of get back in balance. Hibiscus tea. Has anyone ever had hibiscus tea? I'm from Trinidad, and we call it sorrel. And I didn't realize they were the same thing, but we just absolutely love making that stuff. We drink it a lot. I'm like, wow, I think a lot of things in the Caribbean, they just, your grandparents just love making it for you, and it's really good for you. So I'm like, we should do studies on all of them, right? Well, hibiscus tea will actually lower your blood pressure, they found, and it lowers it by about seven points. What they were doing is drinking three cups a day. That's probably a lot of hibiscus tea, but for six weeks, and it was dropping it by seven points for the systolic and four points for the, for the diastolic. I didn't mean to put an S on that bottom one. Another thing that's found to help with blood pressure, and I actually eat every day, is flaxseed. So flaxseed was really good. They gave people three tablespoons of ground flaxseed a day for six months, and it dropped it 9.4 points, and the diastolic 6.7, so it works really good. The reason why I do flaxseed every day is because it has very high omega-3s. And omega-3s are anti-inflammatory, they help to just decrease inflammation, and they're antioxidants, they decrease oxidative stress in your body. They're very good for you. What I do is I take the flaxseed and I grind it up manually. So I have a coffee grinder, no I'm not drinking coffee, I'm just grinding up my flaxseeds in it. And then I put it in my food, whether that be an oatmeal, I'm going to put it on some bread with some almond butter, something like that. And I eat that every day. I don't shoot for three tablespoons, but I guess if you have high blood pressure, you can. After. Because when you grind it, it actually becomes a lot more. So I do, it's three tablespoons of ground flaxseed is what I do. Now I just do like a tablespoon or two. And I make a mix where I put 50-50 ground flaxseed and ground walnuts, and then I add like coconut sugar, and I find that it tastes good. Is this coconut sugar? It might be date sugar. And we just mix it around, and then we put that in the freezer, so we make a lot, put it in the freezer, and we just use it during the day, every, every day for the week. The reason we put it in the freezer is so that we can freeze all those good nutritional components, whereas if you don't refrigerate it, it'll start to break down. Food naturally just breaks down. You know, if you leave it, it's supposed to break down. If you leave a banana out on the counter, it's just going to break down. But if you freeze it, you can keep it, keep some of those nutritional, the nutritional value for a longer period of time. So that's what we do. We make a jar of it, and we just freeze it, use it every day during breakfast. Do you guys want a break? I know we're, we're going to enter what I'll call phase two. <laughs> okay. I know we're like almost at an hour. Let's take a quick break, like five minutes, and then be back around four-ish. Sounds good to me. Is it walnuts? I'm just playing. <laughs>